Welcome to another interesting episode on Swimway Africa YouTube series. It is the pilot series. And on this edition, we would be interacting with someone, a young scientist known otherwise. I mean, that's her AK. She's also known as the eel lady because we'll be talking eels on this episode. And of course, Swimway Africa is about saving migratory fish in Africa. And on this um, series, we're bringing you specialists and experts that work in various um, categories and in various regions across Africa. So joining me now is Dr. Celine. You're welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so like I said, she's otherwise known as the ill lady. All right. And um, if you watch that video, you, you would see um, early run, um, Dr. Selim was trying to explain to me that they were releasing the eel back, you know, into its habitat after taking some bit of measurements and um, for practicals, of course. And so you see that that's pretty large, but she says it's not exactly an adult um, eel. So we're going to be learning more about eels um, with um, Dr. Selene Hansen. I hope I got that correctly. Yes, totally. <laughs> uh, okay. the, the, uh, although it's a, the, the eel you saw on the video, it is an adult eel. They just can grow okay. way much bigger than that. Oh, great. It could grow way more bigger. She said two meters, you said. Two meters long, yeah, right? Up two meters. The biggest one I've seen uh, was 158, which is as tall as me. <laughs> ah, <laughs> whoa, that's a huge one. Okay, so Dr. Celine is originally from Belgium, but she had to move on to South Africa for her PhD since 2016 and happens to still be in South Africa. Hopefully, she stays there for some more time. Yes. Okay, so. Dr. Celine, could you tell us what makes um, the eels very special? Eels, especially African eels, are very special because they are long distance migratory fish. We don't have any other fish that have similar life cycle um, in our part of the world. So our African freshwater eels are born at sea. Um, the consensus is that they're probably born of Madagascar in the oceanic plateau called the Mascarin Ridge. That's probably about 2,000 kilometers long between the Seychelles and Mauritius. And that's for an eel here in South Africa, in my region, that's a migration between six and 10,000 kilometers from, from their Whoa. breeding ground, from their breeding ground there in the ocean to our rivers. So they're going to be born at sea, they're going to be transported by the oceanic current. And at some point, they're going to reach the African coast and they're going to transform and become a small eel called a glass eel. It's going to be five centimeters and transparent. They're going to enter the rivers, start to grow, start to look like a tiny little eel with pigmentation. And then they're going to migrate up the rivers if they can, if there's no, not too much obstacles on their ways. And depending on the species, they're going to spend maybe five, seven years, maybe 20, 40, maybe more than that, we're not too sure. Wow. Then they will go back to the sea, uh, they will migrate back to where they were born, they will reproduce and they will die. So it's, uh. Uh, it's a bit of a very fascinating cycle that's very unique to eels. Oh, interesting. So are these features unique to all types of um, eels with freshwater and marine eels? Um, so we call them freshwater eels because they spend most of their life in freshwater. And when, you know, back in the days when people started calling them freshwater, they didn't know they actually spent their early life um, in, in the ocean. Uh, some of them also could spend a lot of time in the estuary or at sea, and some of them could actually never come up in freshwater. But we don't know what, what proportion of, of these species actually migrate up the rivers or stay in the ocean. That's something we're not sure about. Okay, so we could just say they're eels and it might Yes, <laughs> yes but there are, a lot, uh, there are a lot of um, fish that we call eels um, in English. 
um, oh, that I have that have nothing to do with the eels I'm studying <laughs> that are called okay. freshwater or angrated eels, and some of these other eels might not uh, do such a uh, important and long distance uh, migration route like the one you just saw on the video uh, are doing. Oh wow! So if I heard you correctly, you said you mentioned seven years. Yes. For um, so depending. No, no, no. Um, so, for instance, uh, the African longfin eel, uh, which is only found in Africa, uh, we think they don't stay that much uh, that much time in our rivers. So we think it's about uh, so they will migrate in our rivers from the ocean, and they will stay between five and seven years in the rivers before migrating back to the ocean. Okay. So basically, what's the lifespan of an eel? So it really, depends, it really depends on this on the species. Um, so it, let's just say it's something between five and forty years, depend on the species. Oh, wow. Okay, interesting. All right. So um, when we talk about migration from either freshwater to the ocean or from the ocean seas to freshwater. What does catadromas mean? Because some people, I hear anadromas, I hear catadromas, and I think there are other names. Could you explain yes. that? Um, so you can put all these species together uh, as diadromous species. Dia means okay. two. Uh, okay. So it means they migrate between two types of environment. So mm -hmm. what people usually know internationally is the salmon, and the salmon are anadromous. So they're going to do the, the opposite of the eels. Uh, they're going to breed oh. in the rivers and grow in, fr in, in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And all the eels in the world, uh, all the freshwater eels on the of the world are going to do the opposite. They're going to, uh, they're going to breed in the ocean yeah, and then they go, they're going to grow in freshwater. So that's the difference okay. between anadromous and catadromous. That's basically where they grow and where they breed are two different environments. Mm. That's very explanatory. Okay, so do you have an idea how many species of eels we have in Africa? So in Africa, uh, we have five species uh, because the European eel, um, the European freshwater eel is actually found um, in Northern Africa. Um, okay. Me, I'm only working um, on what we call the, the, the region, which is the Western Indian Ocean region. So I'm looking at what we call tropical eel, which are different from um, temperate eel. So they're going to have to deal okay. with different stress and different threats. And in, in, in this part of the world, we have four. So uh, from Kenya to South Africa, we have four species. And out of these four, uh, some are going to be found throughout uh, the Indian Ocean, maybe a little bit in the Pacific. But we have one eel that's called the African longfin eel um, that is only found in uh, Africa, only found oh. in the Western Indian region. So from Kenya to South Africa, but also in all the islands. So Madagascar, Reunion, uh, Seychelles, all you know these like very uh, beautiful islands as well. <laughs> I love the fact that there is a particular species only found in Africa. So is this um, African long uh, fin eel threatened, uh, you know, is it endangered at this point or is it still in abundance? Um, so um, this particular species, the African long fin eel, which is, uh, which name, scientific name is called Anguilla Mozambica. It's, it's not doing too good. Um, last year, um, it's been, um, it, it went from being least concerned, according to the Red List of Species, to being near threatened, which is actually, okay. it doesn't sound too bad, but it's actually a really big step because you move from a category of conservation that's no least concern. It means like, ah, we're not, we don't, we're not to worry about them just now. But if you cross the step of being near threatened, it means that it's easy to become even more endangered if, if you start okay. to be threatened already. Um, so this species has been um, is now near threatened because um, it lost quite a bit of its distribution uh, range in the last few years. Um, 
uh, up to f down to 50 percent uh, of its distribution has been lost in the last few years and that's uh, part of the reason in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa and that's part of the reason why um, its status has been changed. So mm. it's not doing too good and it's um, there's many reasons, many stresses um, and one of the important ones is the loss of uh, ecological conductivity. So we are in a water stress country. It's very difficult to, to manage our water for people. We do need drinking water. Um, right. And to do that, we've been building dams um, on, on major and, and not so major rivers. And the more we build dams uh, on, these, on, these, on these rivers, um, the less likely it is for eels to go far inland. So that's why they've been losing their, their distribution range because um, they can't really go that far anymore. There's just too many obstacles on their but way. The eel I just saw in that video, and you know, it's slimy and it feels like it could actually bypass um, dams and waterfalls and, you know, just move on. It feels hardy in a way, it could maneuver its way. So how does it, you know, dam um, obstruct its movement? Okay, so when they're very small, uh, when they're less than about 15 centimeters, they're going to be yeah. able to migrate up the rivers and really overcome a really big obstacle. There's a waterfall here in my region that's called Howick Fall. It's about 100 meter high and eels used to be upstream of that waterfall. The problem is that um, we put more and more obstacle on their way. So they're going to take more time to go to, to go far up in the catchment. And the more time they're going to take, the bigger they're going to grow. And if, if they're larger than about 15 centimeters, they're going to lose that ability to climb a big obstacle. They're just going to be too big. They're just going to be too heavy. And it's going to be really difficult for them to go up yeah. these obstacles. Um, so yeah, even if they look like really good swimmer, if you have a vertical wall of... I, I'm not too sure what would be the minimum for them to overcome, but the bigger they grow, um, the more difficult it's going to be for them um, to overcome this obstacle. Mm, interesting. Okay, so you talked about um, postdoctorate research. So which are you currently on at the moment? So we're working on, on a big project between different countries uh, through WIOMSA, which is the Western Indian Marine Association. Um, so we're working with teams in South Africa, in Mozambique and in Kenya to look at an uh, important part of their life cycle. We're going to look, we are looking already at recruitment, which is okay. a, a vulnerable part of their life when they move from the ocean to the rivers and they're about this big and transparent so it's very very tricky for us to study them so that's okay. all happening in the estuaries um so between the ocean and the river and we're also looking at escapement which is also an important part of their life cycle that's when they're going to move from the rivers back to the sea to start their migration back to where they were born on top of that, we also um, interested in social fisheries, um, which means how important are eels and associated fisheries for people and livelihood, and not just for livelihood, but also in terms of culture and spirituality and and, and traditions. Um, because in other part of the world, eels are economically very important. Uh, from where I come from in Belgium, they are a delicacy, um, or in, also in Southeast Asia, you've got very uh, a lot of sushis and an important traditional dish made out of eels. And here um, okay. in South Africa, at least, uh, you, there's not a really big culture about them, or, or maybe there is, but we just don't know too much about it yet. <laughs> so that that's that's what we want to know. Okay, so why should anyone listening right now, why is it important to learn the behavior of migratory fish? Because you mentioned livelihood and you mentioned community as well. So why should we know the behavior of this migratory fish? Well, you know, because they are long distance migratory fish, they're going to inform us on the health and the well-being of the river they occupy. If, oh. if they're there, there's a chance that the system is healthy. If the system is healthy, 
it's good it's good for people because they will probably have healthy healthy system around them and that means um, it's good for water resources drinking water but it's also good for anything that's associated with life in our rivers um, and a lot of people in Africa depends heavily on fisheries resources so if you have um, happy fish, happy rivers. You're gonna have happy people. <laughs> it's a bit simple, that. but you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, so could we say there are also stress indicators? Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so talking about eels, um, uh, there are terms like radio tag, DNA barcoding, and all of that. Could you explain to? A layman, what does those mean? So we, we've done a few a few projects on them already. Um, uh, the first thing you mentioned, radio tags, um, was to really learn about their behavior throughout the years and the season. Um, so they would have a little tag that works on 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 radio frequency um, inserted in their belly. Um, they would have all an individual um, frequency. So as I spent a year on the Chigela in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, um, going to find my eels, uh, we tagged 20. So okay. all individual, we, we know which eel was who and what we, they were, where they were and what they were up to. Um, okay. So we, we were able to follow them for a year and, and see that they, they behave differently uh, according to the season. For instance, in winter, sometime I would go track my eels and I would I would find the same one for weeks at the same spot, just hiding under a big rock, waiting for for better weather to come back. Um, uh, does, so we learn. Does that, we learn. Does that mean that they don't leave that um, terrain? Uh, I yes, mean, so in, in for winter, a period in of winter, one year you tracked, it didn't yes. leave the particular habitat. No, when 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 they're in fresh water, when they've done migrating, when they're like big enough to decide, you know, I'm big, I'm a bit lazy, maybe <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to move. I'm gonna find a great spot and I'm gonna I'm gonna stay there. And especially if it's like they oh, wow. really like really deep pool and where we work, where we radio tag them, um, there's there's plenty of food for them. So there's not really necessarily a need for them to to move a lot and they can grow really big. We tag eels up to about nine kilos and 1.5 meters. So, you know, they're just gi giant fish, the, the, a bit of the river of the, the monster of the river. And, and they're not very active fish. Um, they have quite a, what we call a restricted home range, which means that um, the space they occupy over a period of a year is, is quite small. Mm. So from, from what we learn from radio tag, we see that there's quite a big variability between between these individual. And I think if I remember correctly, the smallest one over the course of a year would use um, would use the space of a football field. And the biggest oh. the biggest one was using I usually make the comparison to the Vatican City, which is I think a kilometer square. So um, it, it really depends on the individuals, uh, so, but in, in all in all, they don't they don't use use that much space over a course of okay. a year. Okay, um, so that's radio tag. How about DNA barcoding? Okay, well, so I said that we have four eels in South Africa, and they are quite tricky to identify on the field. You have to take okay. very precise measurement of their fin and where the fin starts. And while well, you've seen on the video, you know, they're really mm -hmm. sliming fish. So it's, it's quite difficult to get really precise measurement. You also have to look at their coloration, at, at, at their teeth and all these mm. things. And it, it, quite be very, it can be very tricky. So it's very difficult to ID them to the species properly. So we looked at the use of genetic and their DNA. Um, okay. So DNA barcoding is a way to to confirm species identification through genetic um okay. so, so so it's it's quite easy we take a, a fin clip uh, we go to the lab and then we get a sequence from it and we can just check if it's the right species or not um it, it's called co1 barcoding and it, it's a really good method because you don't it's a non-lethal method um, meaning that it's it's good for species that are threatened and maybe in 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 lower abundance 
and it's wow. also a methodology that's also fairly accessible especially in Africa because it's it's not very expensive and it's not too difficult it doesn't re require very like high tech and high hand training um, and it's been used in um, illegal traffic monitoring all around the world um, so yeah, it's, it's a very How? good methodology that's um, that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> well wow. eels are um are a victim of um illegal trade all around the world because um oh. in in some part of the world they're so important in terms of you know food culture and delicacy so there is a big oh. uh, a really big uh, traffic going on uh, some might say it's one of the biggest crime to wildlife because it goes unseen <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's not it's people talk about people talk a lot about pangolin and rhino because they're big and charismatic and 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 people know a lot about them. But eels, uh, people smuggle them when when they're glass eel and they're this big and they can just go in ziploc ziploc bag across <laughs> the world, going unseen, and and there there are different laws and different rules uh, depending on which species uh, people are trading illegally. Um, and when they're very small, they're even more difficult to ID to the species. So the fact that you can have an identification through the use of DNA that, it, that is quick and cheap, make it uh, easier to, to monitor that illegal trade. Um, and, and, and how do you say that? Um, <laughs> charge people um, we, who are smuggling eels uh, in and out of certain countries, depending on the species they are trading oh brilliant wow i've really learned a lot because um and now i understand why the research is very important especially for the eels and for the people like you said earlier if we have um happy eels we're going to have happy rivers and then happy people right <laughs> okay, a bit so simple, what, yes. <laughs> what can i do to help what can anyone listening know viewing right now what can they do to learn to help with um you know your projects or any other that has to do with eels i think it's very important to to that people learn about them educate themselves about them so i think a series like this is quite important uh it's all about caring caring for for the environment and caring for the world around us so you know there are simple simple things people can do to save water um not throw litter, stuff, things like that, you know, care about your waste, care about your water consumption, um, because again, happy river, happy fish, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all goes together. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Salim. This has been really amazing and interesting with you. Thank you okay. for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's how far we can go on this episode. My name is Wane Afronelli from Nigeria, and I have been interacting with the ill lady, Dr. Celine Hansen, from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.